views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. This meeting is hosted by Community School Superintendent of Community School District 10, Maribel Torres Halla. This meeting will be facilitated by Maria C. Correa and Elba Ivalez of the district office. Moderators for the English room in the Zoom will be Anthony Thomas and Mohamed Morshed from the DOE Family and Community Empowerment Office or FACE. Moderators for the Spanish room with the call-in number will be Jose Gonzalez and Lynn Sanchez from the uh, Department of Education, Family and Community Empowerment Office or FACE. So um, just to welcome you, we welcome you all to our Community School District 10 Town Hall meeting. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, our superintendent, uh, Maribel Torres Halla, will be presenting updated information on school reopening and fielding <laughs> some questions from the participants on our call. Um, Excuse me. So I'll introduce my colleague, Maria Correa, if she's ready to continue. Yes, thank you, Alba. Good evening again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as has been mentioned, our superintendent Maribel Torres Hulla will be presenting updated information on school reopening and will be fielding some questions from the participants on our call. As information changes and becomes available, we will continue to notify the CSD 10 community at upcoming CEC meetings, President's Council meetings, DLT meetings, and additional town halls. We will not get to everyone's questions this evening. However, our team will compile the questions and create a document to share with all of you. Here are a few reminders. Please keep yourself on mute whenever you are not speaking. This is a public meeting and it is being recorded. The only persons who should share their cameras are the superintendent and the CSD 10 team members. I will now reintroduce my colleague, Alba Velez, our district family leadership coordinator, so that she can go over interpretation for this evening. As stated before, uh, thank you very much for all the interpreters that have come to attend this meeting and interpreting for all the families and members of this community. Thank you in particular to Catalina Gomez Luna and Nicolás Rodolowski, our interview, uh, inter interpreters for this evening and Pia Michelle of the Translation and Interpretation Unit. They will now announce instructions in Spanish for attendees who may wish to dial into the Spanish line at this time. You should also see the dial-in information on your screen. Hola, buenas noches a todos. Eh, si quisieran atender esta llamada por teléfono en español, por favor, marques desde su celular al 347-966-4114 e ingrese el código de conferencia 821-096-54 y numeral. Repito, el número es 347-966-4114 y el número de conferencia es 821-096-54 numeral. Si usted quiere escuchar la reunión en español y también quiere ver la conferencia, usted lo puede hacer desde su computadora. Solamente tiene que poner en silencio su computadora o bajarle todo el volumen y llamar desde su celular. Repito, el número es 
4114 y el número de conferencia es 821-09654, numeral. Muchas gracias. Because we will have simultaneous interpretation throughout this meeting, it is important that everyone speaks slower than usual to allow the interpreters to keep up. Please do not talk over anyone. And again, a special thank you to our interpreters for providing this impor important service to our Spanish speaking families. I will now pass the microphone back to my colleague, Maria Correa. We have one more logistical item to cover before we officially start. And that is how we are going to allow for questions tonight. There will be a questions and answer period for parents, community members, and other stakeholders to ask the superintendent. First, we will take questions and comments from participants joined via computer in the Zoom room. Please press the raise your hand icon on the bottom of your screen or in the participants list to be recognized at that time. Or please type your name and the word speak in all caps into the chat box. When your name is called, please repeat and spell your first and last name before beginning your comment or question. Second, we will take questions and comments from participants in the Spanish room. We will have about two minutes of silence to allow Jose and Lynn from FACE to collect the names of Spanish speaking participants who wish to speak. The interpreters will then interpret into English. Finally, if you have called in using phone only, Anthony and Mohammed from FACE will call out the last four digits of your phone number. You will have to unmute by pressing star six and say yes or no if you would like to say something. If you would like to speak, please state and spell your first and last name slowly before beginning your comment. For those who have called in via phone, again, please remember you can mute and unmute your lines by pressing star six. And now, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome and introduce our Community School District 10 Superintendent, Maribel Torres Hulla. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight with us for our first town hall meeting. Um, I wanted to, again, introduce myself as a Community School District 10 Superintendent. Um, leading 57 schools and five pre-K centers. Could not do this without any of you, without our, with the wonderful team that we have, and of course, without the Department of Education. Just wanna reiterate on some of our beliefs in Community School District 10. As you see in front of you, there's a PowerPoint that we will be presenting tonight. And a part of our work and how we lead is leading with the heart, mind, and soul. If you know anything about District 10 and you've been working with our schools, social emotional learning has really been at the core of our instruction and at the core of supporting our district families and students. At this time, I would like to introduce our District 10 team, Fia Davis, our Deputy Superintendent, Good evening, everyone. Bea Davis here, happy to be here and a part of the District 10 family. Gina Mashki Mitchell, unfortunately, could not be here with us, but she is our other deputy superintendent. We also have Carmen Mercado, our field support liaison. Good evening, everyone. Happy to be here. 
Elizabeth Idavia, our Director of Continuous Improvement. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Happy to be here with District 10. Thank you. Hope Stevens, our Director of Continuous Improvement. Hope it's muted, but <laughs> and she said hello. Uh, Lushanda yes, Matt. Good uh, evening, I, everyone. Thank, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Hope. Lushanda Mack, our Director of Continuous Improvement. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. Sarah Greeson Mitchell, Teacher Development Evaluation Coach. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having us. And I'm also a proud parent of a District 10 student. We have Jacqueline Baker, our Early Childhood Director. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Elba Velez, District Family Leadership Coordinator. And Maria Carrara, which you've met also, District Family Support Coordinator. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thanks again for joining us this evening. And Sharon Berger, Executive Ex Assistant to the Superintendent. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the District 10 Town Hall. It's a pleasure to be here and good to see everyone. Thank you. Again, welcome everyone. So at this time, I just wanna take the time to explain. I know many of our families have been hearing about remote and blended learning and the experiences that our students will encounter during the school year 2020, 2021. So remote slash blended learning. Synchronous, which is a word that you're going to constantly hear also, synchronous learning refers to a learning event in which a group of students are engaging in. What this means is I'm sure many of you have seen your children using instant messaging, live chat, webinars, and video conferencing. This is allowing students and teachers to collaborate on real time. We also have asynchronous learning, which is basically a general term used to describe education, instruction, and learning that does not occur at the same time or at the same place. The term is commonly used and is applied to a various forms of digital and online learning in which students can learn a, through a pre-recorded video or a game-based learning task. What this means is many of our families know that some of our students use a platform called iReady. They do use iReady for math, they use iReady for ELA. So that would be considered an asynchronous learning type of environment. Now I would like to introduce, and I'm sure many of you have seen some of this as well. These are the models that the Department of Education have asked principals to decide what type of model they will use in their school in collaboration with their school community. So model one, and these are the models that our chancellor has put forth. Model one option is specifically for elementary, middle, and high schools. So any of our elementary, middle, and high schools in collaboration with their school community could have chosen this model. What this model shows in model 1A is that students week one will be group A, a cohort, and then group B is another cohort. So if we cover group the, the Monday, if you notice, our students will be in school, group A one day, group B the next day on Wednesday, group C, group A again Thursday, and group B again on Friday. What happens on the Monday, the Monday becomes a rotating day. So on that Monday, one week group A will come in, the following week group B will come in. For model 1B, each cohort of students will then come to school three days consecutively. So group A will come to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday, and Monday, group B, and then starts again group A, and then starts again group B. Model two, this will be one to two days per week with, an alter with alternating weeks. So what this 
brings is three cohorts. So the schools will create three cohorts of students who come in. They will have group A, group B, and group C. This model will allow group A to come to school on Monday, group B to come to school on Tuesday, group A comes back on Wednesday, group B comes back on Thursday, and then group C comes on Friday and then it rotates. So group B starts the next week, group C comes the following day on Tuesday, group A will start again that rotation. So each, rotate, each rotated cohort will take turns coming in at least two times a week. This option, model three, is a six day rotation and this has three cohorts. This option is not available for elementary schools. This option was only available for middle schools and high schools. Group A will come to school on Monday, group B on Tuesday, group C on Wednesday, and then the rotation begins again. For model 3B, instead of the cohorts coming in one day, at one day and then the next day and then the next day, what model three, the change is that the students will come in two days consecutively. So they will come in back to back group A, Monday and Tuesday, group B, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday and Monday, the next day. So every two days, group C and so forth. Model four was not an option for elementary, middle, or any of our, our schools, community school, district 10 schools. This model is specifically for district 75 schools, which has a different superintendent. However, I thought it was really important to also share some of the model and the option that was provided to D75 students. So model 4A has a group, and one group, and that one group will come to school for one whole week. So Monday through Friday, the second week, Group B comes. So basically it just changes week by week. Group, each group will then take a turn coming to school week by week. Model 4B, you will have a group of students who will come to school as a, another group. And what this model does is alternates a group and that's the group C. So group C will have a full-time schedule. So they will do one week group A, one week group B. However, group C will still be in the building when A is there and when C is there. So that is the difference between this model here. It includes a third group. So in the building, if people went brick and mortar, right, at the school building, group C will be there on one week with group A and one week with group B. The last option, is also for District 75. And this is model, it also has two models, 5A and a 5B. And so again, 5A, three consecutive days for the cohort of group A, and then three consecutive days, again, for the next group, the next cohort. And then it transitions again, and it goes into two, to two, to three. For 5B, similar to what we mentioned for group model four, except again, the change, excuse me, um, the change happens with that group C being in the building on those consecutive days for group A and for group B. At this time, I would like to introduce again, our deputy superintendent, Fia Davis, who will review some instructional guidance for, for the fall of 2020. Um, and this is again, what we have as the information is current, um, day by day, we're getting new information. So as we get more information, we will continue to have some more town hall meetings. You can also join our community education council meetings, which are also public, and we will pre be presenting more information. Fia Davis. Hello again, everyone. Instructional guidance for the fall 2020 through the 21 school year. Students must have equitable access to high quality instruction and educational opportunity. Expectations for high quality instruction rest upon the same essential elements of strong core instruction that are culturally responsive, whether students are learning in an all remote 
or in a blended learning model. Instruction for all students must focus on these key elements. First, begin with no students well. That has been our focus since last year. Following, integrate academics and social emotional learning. Please know that every school has been charged with having a social and emotional learning curriculum. In addition, every school has a social emotional team. And schools in District 10 are focused on ruler as one of their curriculums, leader in me, or restorative justice practices. Ensuring continuity of learning through a shared and inclusive curriculum and the focus on priority learning. This means that we are meeting our students where they are, differentiated instruction, really meeting the needs of students with disabilities, assessing where students are upon the return to fall or as we move forward to fall, as I like to say. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So we have been getting lots of questions focused on instruction. And what we've done today is put these questions together in order to provide you with some answers and, and sort of front load some of the questions you might have and that might already be present in the chat. First question, will my child have the same teacher for remote and in-person instruction? Although actual student programming has not been completed yet, Schools will try to the best of their abilities to keep students with the same teacher. However, there will be instances when this is not feasible. Question two, will there be Saturday programs or after school? It will be dependent upon the school budget. Three, what will teaching look like for 100% remote learning? Will there be live teaching for remote students? Remote learning will continue to be a blended model between synchronous and asynchronous teaching, which is what Superintendent Hullo referred to earlier. Students will participate on the same curricula as in-person students. Four, what will the testing schedule, what is the testing schedule for this year, pardon me? ELA, Tuesday, April 20th through Thursday, April 22nd. Math. Tuesday, May 4th through Thursday, May 6th. Regents, that information has not yet been provided by the New York State Education website. Five, what are the accommodations for students with disabilities? These are guided by the student's individualized education plan or IEPs. IEPs will be granted their appropriate accommodations. Six, what are the accommodations for students with disabilities, including related services? Will the service be in person or virtual? Special education services will be dated by the IEP document. The services will be provided in person or remotely as necessary and wherever possible. Seven, how will enrichment classes like music, art, and STEM be taught? Enrichment courses will be provided both on an in-person and remotely, social, social distance and student safety will be a priority. Next slide, please. And so now I'd like to introduce my colleague and our field support liaison for District 10, Carmen Mercado. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Davis. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. At this time, I will proceed with the frequently asked questions around school environment. Number one, where will my child be eating? Grab and go meals will be available for breakfast and lunch and take place in the classroom. If I choose 100% remote, will my child have access to meals? Yes, the expectation is that we continue preparing breakfast and lunch for all students. When will schools be meeting with parents to explain options or choices? Principals have been scheduling school-based town hall meetings to explain their choices last week and the current one. How will social emotion 
we are providing a district-wide effort on addressing the social emotional needs of all school constituents. Every school has a group of professionals dedicated to ensuring that we meet the needs of all. Will parents be able to view the brick and mortar classroom setup? Unfortunately, no. We will be limiting school visits to ensure a healthy and safe space for the school community. How will the issue of ill teachers be addressed? Any teacher who is ill will be required the same level of quarantine as any other person in the building. Same safety protocols will be followed. How will students be participating in gym? With the proper social distance and safety being a uh, priority. Will there be school holidays? The calendar is currently being discussed and as soon as the calendar is available, it will be disseminated to all constituents. And now I turn it over to our family team, Elba Velez and Maria Correa. Some of the questions that families are asking are how can I sign up for childcare as per the mayor's initiative? Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio announced in July that he would have a public childcare program uh, throughout the city that will see kids supervised in public and private locations across the five boroughs. New York City will provide child care to over 100,000 New York City kids this fall as the Department of Education in an attempt to protect students from coronavirus offers in-school learning two or three times a week. No further guidance regarding uh, the child care has been provided as of yet, but we will share it as soon as we receive it. Two, what other options will be provided for families that need school for the early childhood grades? Families can apply in one of three ways, online on, at www.nyc.gov slash pre-K, over the phone by calling 311, or in person at one of the Department of Education's 12 family welcome centers. We have two in the Bronx. What is going to happen to the rec centers? That can they still be considered an option for parents who need to work five days a week? More information regarding the rec centers is forthcoming. We know some rec centers are not schools. They are private buildings. So perhaps some of these spaces will be leveraged in addition to childcare options and the mayor's initiative, the services and childcare that they will be offering. Will iPads still be provided? Those students who already have a device should continue to use the device that they have. Incoming students, however, without devices should apply for these devices using the link at coronavirus.schools.nyc.remote learning devices. We'll put that in the chat room for those of you who are interested. What will happen to families will, without Wi-Fi? The city is currently negotiating new contracts to extend the free Wi-Fi services for those students who need them. Further information will be provided. Please note any DOE issue device such as the iPads that were provided, were already equipped with Wi-Fi. Does the DOE have workshops for parents on how to use the platform uh, before the school year begins in September? 
some parent workshops continue to be developed. In addition to a new app called Learn at Home, which you can uh, find on the DOE website, this app is also available on all DOE issue iPads. The Learn at Home app is helpful in supporting students' remote learning needs giving parents, students, and staff the ability to stay connected and informed through quick access to the student accounts and other learning apps and technical support. The app also provides students with links to all the tools that they need to attend class, complete assignments, and track their progress. The Learn at Home features can be accessed by using this link, www.schools.nyc.gov slash learning slash learning at home. Will there be any uh, post, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, will they be post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD support for families? DOE is fully aware that some of the emotional learning, social learning has to occur very early in the school year. But in addition to all the cell curriculum, both at the beginning of each day and during contact er content areas, uh, students will also have access to an array of professional services to assist them coping with any difficulty they may experience. Families should be in constant contact with their school principal or staff at the school level if they feel that their children are experiencing any kind of issues or concerns. In ad addition, we have some hotlines for support, one which is from New York City, 1888-NYC-WELL, or 1886929355. And there is an additional New York State emotional support hotline at one eight four four. 863-9314. How can parents change from blended learning to remote? There will be some designated time frames throughout the course of the school year where parents can choose blended learning within the school building. Parents and students will have to wait until uh, we can ensure a safe transition for the child into blended learning. And this includes securing space to maintain social distance and ensuring the proper protocols in regards to student and staff ratio. There is a link that you can uh, go on if you need to uh, put the preference of your child's um, education. So it's www.nycenet.edu slash surveys slash learning preferences. You can indicate on the learning preferences what it what kind of environment if you want blended or remote learning. And now we will return our program back to Superintendent Haller, who will speak on safety. Thank you, Elba. I just want to reiterate a little more on question number eight, how can parents change from blended learning to remote? So I want to make sure that if you have not completed the survey and you're not sure how to complete the survey, please, you can contact our office or you can call your school, contact your school so that you can get the link to ensure that you complete the survey. Parents who do not complete the survey, their child will automatically be placed into a blended learning model. 
At any point, you can say that you do not want to be a part of the blended learning model any longer. However, it's just very important to know that if you want 100% remote learning, and so that we make the proper accommodations for all children and families and our teachers as well, we wanna make sure that the survey is completed and that your option is provided appropriately. Thank you so much. This time I wanna go over some of our safety. Um, and this has been created and developed with the Department of Health along with the New York City Department of Education. So as we mentioned, health and safety is our priority. And we wanna make sure that we're promoting behaviors that reduce the spread of COVID. So physical distancing. All individuals in a school building should remain at least six feet apart. We will work with schools to create conditions that make physical distancing possible. So as you know, this is the reason why we cannot go back to children being in school 100% of the time. Wearing a face covering, so face coverings will be required inside school buildings. Exceptions will be developmentally and age appropriate, consistent with guidance of health agencies and paired with increased PPE for staff. NYC DOE is procuring distributing PPE for students and staff to use inside the school building. We want to ensure that our children and our adult and the adults in the school, everyone is keeping their hands clean. The DOE is ensuring that they will provide soap and hand sanitizer to all schools and that that would be available throughout the day to our students and to our staff members as well as signage and floor markings. So when you return to the building or you visit a building, if you need to, when you schedule an appointment, they should be signage and floor markings and the schools will have this um, as part of the New York City Health for Care Actions Prevention. Health and safety. So there are key tenants to this plan. And as I mentioned, the health and safety of the staff and the students are utmost priority when considering reopening. The guidance has been developed, as I mentioned earlier, with the Department of Health and, Hi and Mental Hygiene and Health and Hospitals. The key tenants of the New York City Department of Education's plan align to the CDC and New York State Department of Health guidance on school reopening. In addition to these public health protocols, we are prioritizing mental health, social emotional learning, and trauma informed supports for all schools. So, as part of A, promoting behaviors that reduce the spread, again, to reiterate, where physical distancing has to be six feet, everyone has to wear a face mask, keeping hands clean, and signage and floor markings. For B, maintaining healthy environments. We want to make sure that the changes to a, that there's changes to a school building when necessary, that there's going to be cleaning and disinfecting on a daily basis, and the food services will also follow these guidelines. Maintaining healthy operations. So again, testing, screening, entry protocols, all of that is being developed, and guidelines for that are forthcoming. Preparing for when someone gets sick. I will share a chart with you exactly and describing how that would look like. So thinking about if you're sick, you must stay home, if whether you're a child or a, st a staff member. Returning to school after symptoms, there's going to be protocols that in order for a child or a staff member to come back to school, we have to make sure that they are cleared to come back to the school. So response, it would be a response to unconfirmed cases. And there's also going to be a response to even one confirmed case. Um, a response to two or more confirmed cases is also going to look very differently. As a city, if we reach a 3% mark, then as a city, we will go back to fully remote learning. So these were some of the questions that came up. Again, as families, as we've been meeting with families with, um, throughout our schools um, regarding safety concerns. So how will sanitation be handled inside of school buildings, including bathrooms and elevators? So schools will be clean on a thoroughly on a daily basis. Bathrooms and any public facilities will have soap, paper towels, and hand sanitizers avail available. 
temperature checks. We've been hearing a lot about temperature checks and how will temperature checks be conducted. So again, a daily health screening, including temperature checks, must be completed at home by families and by school-based staff. The DOE will launch a robust education campaign that makes clear to parents and school-based staff how important these daily health checks are to keeping school communities healthy and safe. The DOE is also committed to purchasing thermometers for at-home use for families who may need them. Full guidance can be found in the COVID-19 school health policy guidance. And again, if you go onto the Department of Education website under families, you will see some of this guidance available to you. What will the procedure for when a child or an adult tests positive in a classroom? What's the procedure for that? And what are the requirements for returning to school? So again, as I mentioned earlier, we will make sure that there's a nurse available and that there is a containment room in every school. So every school has to have a plan for a containment and isolation room. There are specific procedures that they must follow in case one or more students test positive in a classroom, including quarantine the class or the school based on the numbers of positive cases. How will families be notified regarding possible exposure? Families will be notified immediately by the school via email, phone call, and with a letter backpacked to your, with your child. Busing, how will busing be handled? So busing will be available and schedules will be finalized once there is more information around which students need busing and on what days. School buses will not be available to transport students to or from school except on their designated days. Schools are expected to work closely with families to clearly communicate what days their child will attend. Schools should provide busing information and schedules to the children who are eligible for the busing. And not only to the students, but obviously to the families as well. Students who arrive at the school on the incorrect day will be expected to return home and the school will have a protocol in place for that um, if someone comes to school on the wrong day. As part of school opening, teachers should make the policy clear that students arriving on the wrong day will need to be picked up or will be sent home and the alternate childcare arrangements need to be made to ensure that there is not a pattern of students arriving on incorrect days. So what happens when a student gets injured and taken to the hospital? So as we do currently, the family will be notified as soon as possible prior to deciding if a child is going to be taken to the hospital. We cannot decide to take a child to the hospital without parental consent. We will always make any decision based on the student individual needs at the moment of the, in of the injury. What plans have been put in place for contact tracing? So the city of New York through the Department of Health will be monitoring positive cases along with contact tracing. All staff members will be asked to take a COVID-19 test in the days before the first day of school. School staff will have priority access for testing. And there's a specific link that has been sent and will be sent to school staff. With tests providing a free of charge and with expedited results. This test is also available for families citywide. So in conclusion, if there is a case that has to be investigated, during the investigation, the, if it's one case, one confirmed case, that classroom will be closed. Classroom will be, remain closed until we are positive that it is ready to be opened. If two cases linked together in the same school, the same classroom, again, the classroom will be closed. The classroom will remain closed for 14 days. Students and staff in close contact with positive cases will have to self-quarantine for 14 days. If two cases linked together in a different class, so now we're talking about two different cases, but two different classrooms. 
then the entire school will be closed. So classrooms of each class will remain closed, quarantine, and additional school members will also be quarantined. And obviously everyone will be informed of the protocol for that once the school is closed. Last question, if parents, parents will be allowed into the school building, I think we answered that earlier in regards to yes. We don't wanna say that parents will not be allowed in the school building at all. We wanna make sure that the building flow is one that can be managed and handled. And so we are asking that if you have to make an appointment to come to the school, that you keep that appointment or that you call the, print, the school and inform them that you can either make the appointment or that you will be coming to the appointment. Schools will continue to monitor practices, including temperature checks for all adults entering the school building. And we wanna make sure that they maintain a safety and well-being for all staff. So where are we now? We wanna make sure that our families know the process of what and the decisions that have been made currently. So this week was a really important week for many of our schools. Um, the parent survey, yes, it is still open. As we mentioned earlier, if you have not completed that survey, please make sure to do so. Um, any survey that stays open, again, the parent, the, you will become blended learning. However, you can make the request to go 100% remote learning. This week, um, many of our schools should have closed out some of their town hall meetings and have met with their school leadership teams to collaborate on which of the model choices that I described earlier, the school was going to move forward with. All decisions for school model choices have to be submitted by Friday, August 14th, but I'm happy to announce that all of our schools have submitted their model choices. So if you're not sure of the choice that your school has chosen, please make sure to contact your parent coordinator or the principal at the school. Um, in regards to opening, reopening plans, every single school in New York City, so every school in District 10, had to complete a reopening plan. This plan is being submitted not just to the city, but also to the state. The plan will be able, you will be able to um, access this plan on your child's uh, school's website. So by Wednesday, August 12th, which was yesterday, all of those reopening plans had to be submitted. And again, proud to say that 100% of our plans have been submitted to the city and to the state. Last, I just want to make sure that everyone understands this will not be the last town hall meeting. As you know, we are getting information on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. And so we will continue and we want to continue to communicate and host these town hall meetings to provide you with information in regards to the district, but also as how we are learning as a community. And so I know that we have our upcoming Community Education Council 10. Um, as I mentioned earlier, please, you can participate at that. I will be also um, giving updates when we come together as a Community Education Council. Um, and we will also be hosting some more town hall meetings throughout the year and hope that you join us. At this time, we are going to take some questions. I will stop sharing my screen. And again, as I mentioned, we are hopeful that we can answer some of your questions. Um, and if not, we will make sure to jot down your questions. Um, it's very important if you can provide us with your name and the school that your child attends so that we can ensure to provide the information appropriately. Maria Elba, you can open up the floor for questions and answers. And I know I just want to also reiterate, I know we were supposed to end at 7 p.m. I apologize for us opening a little later and on technical difficulties, um, but we will keep the floor open for about 30 minutes so that we can accommodate you and your concerns or any questions that you may have. I also have some team members who are answering some of the questions on the chat. So if we don't hear you verbally, feel free to put in some questions on the chat and we will also be answering through the chat. So thank you very much, Superintendent Hala. We do have several hands raised uh, from our attendees. This 
this evening. And I'm going to ask uh, Diana Adames, whose hand is raised. If you have a question, you can post it in the chat or you will be asked to unmute yourself. If I may, to um, members of the community who will ask questions, Superintendent Hulla has offered 30 minutes. I would ask that you keep your question to two minutes so that we can get as many voices as possible. I'll gently remind you if you come close to your two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Davis. So I see some questions really quick while we're waiting for our, um, our first question verbally. Um, I did see a question in regards to remote learning. Every school will have an option of remote learning. So if you decide as a parent that you want the option of blended learning, so blended learning will include your child will be placed into a cohort. Your child will then, depending on the model that your school has decided on, um, your child will have two to three days where they attend school at the school building. And then the other days, they will have remote learning. So remote learning will still take place for all of our schools. At this point, not all of our, and not, no one can actually fulfill the requirement of having 100% of students in the school building. Because of social distancing, the highest that we have reached in District 10 with some of our schools, as you know, some of our schools range in sizes, um, is 33%. So the highest amount of students that can be in a school would be only 33% of the students. So we have to take into account what that looks like. It's gonna be very differently. So teachers and parents and principals who got together to decide on the model had to look at specific data. They looked at the accommodations data. They looked at the data that parents provided in the sense of the survey, who said they would apply to blended learning and who said they would work um, remotely straight from home. And so those considerations were, were taken as people decided on which model they were going to pick. So thank you, Superintendent Hala. If Ms. Adamas is not, uh, able to ask the question, please post it in the chat. We are going to move on to Bernarda Caceres. Bernarda Caceres. Your hand is up, Ms. Caceres. Uh, please ask your question. So as we wait for Ms. Caceres, um, another great question that I just saw is, when will parents be informed of the model decision by August 28th, all parents should receive a notification. Parents, if you will have not turned on your school's account, please make sure to do so. Sign up for the school's account. The DOE will then email you, your principal, your child's principal will email you. And by August 28th, you should know the program that your, that your child's school will follow. As of right now, the first day of school will begin, the date that we have officially been, been giving. But again, I wanna just mention that that can change. Um, the date is September 10th. September 10th is the first day of school. So another question that I see, and I'm, I'm going to just try to answer some questions from the chat um, in regards to blended learning. If someone wants to opt into 100% remote, when will they be given the option to opt back into blended learning? So that option will be available to parents. However, the most important thing to know is that it's not going to happen overnight because we want to make sure that the programming is done appropriately if a parent wants to opt in to remote learning, they can do that at any time. However, if you wanna opt in to blended learning, 
right? The programs for the in school, in the building is very different. We need to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of staff members at the school. So that might take a little bit of time. The window for that, we do not know specifically, but we do know that you will have that option if you want to change your mind and go from remote learning to blended learning, that option will be available to you. It may take one week, it may take two weeks, we're not sure of the amount of time that it will take. We have a question uh, from uh, Richard Espinal on whether uh, CBOs after school programs will be allowed in the building to provide services. I'm sorry, I see a question in regards to Bronx Science High School. And I just wanna just mention, I apologize. I am not the uh, community school district. I'm the community school district 10 superintendent. What that means is I am the superintendent for elementary schools, middle schools. I do have a six through 12 school, which is Intech and Riverdale um, Kingsbridge Academy. The other high schools are under high school superintendents. Um, Bronx High School of Science, the superintendent for Bronx High School of Science is Sabrina Cook. I'm sorry, Elba, can you repeat that question? Uh, we have a question in the Q&A. Will after school programs that are run by outside vendors be allowed to operate in the school building? So I do know we wanna be very specific about that. Um, Carmen, can you help me with this question in regards to operations and after school program? Sure, Superintendent. I think that they're still negotiating the after school program. Um, that won't happen during the first or second week of school. I think that they have to figure out how they can run the after school programs and social distance. Thank you, Carmen. I know we also had another important question in regards to siblings and siblings, one being in middle school, one being in elementary school. One of the things that we have asked our principals to do as they're taking into consideration um, which cohort to place a child in, we, a lot of our schools, elementary schools have feeder schools. So what I mean by that is that some of our elementary schools automatically when most of the students will go to a specific middle school. If that's the case, there are reports that our schools can run that will show who are the siblings, right? And so we have asked our principals to communicate to each other um, and try to whatever, whenever possible to make sure that the students who have siblings are in the same cohort, especially if they're in the same school, right? So we wanna make sure that the siblings are in the same cohort if they're in cohort A, so that siblings can go together to school and similarly with some of our feeder schools. We have a question on ICT students. Well, uh, what will teaching look like for ICT students as per the IEP? Will they have a special education teacher and general ed teacher in the classroom? Will they be a student ratio of both gen ed and special ed in the classroom? Great question, thank you, Alba. Yes, so ICT is a mandate and that's a mandate that is required. So students who have an IEP are mandated to be taught by the special ed teacher, a licensed special ed teacher, and then the general ed students have to have a general education teacher. So that is a mandate. If there is an ICT class in the building, the ICT class must have to, as of right now, I know that there are some negotiations taking place because while we understand that in the classroom, we can only basically have about six to eight bodies. Um, so some of some, some negotiations that are happening right now is how could that look like? Is it possible to have a, a teacher, the special ed teacher with the licensed special ed possibly doing remote within those the classroom uh, and live teaching while the general ed teacher is in there in the building? Or is it that we need to have both? But yes, ICT classes will have two teachers. How exactly that's going to look, we're still not sure. If they're in the building though, the class will function as an ICT class. It's a 60-40 ratio. So 60% general ed, 40% special ed and they were, both teachers would have to be included within that ratio as well uh, in the classroom for space. 
Superintendent Hala, Ms. Latoya Morong would like to ask a question. She has been unmuted. Ms. Morong, you can ask your question. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Latoya Morong and my son goes to PS24. My name is spelled L-A-T-O-Y-A, last name M-A-R-O-N-G. Um, my concern right now for PS24 is what will drop off look like if parents are not allowed in the building, especially for younger kids. We haven't met the teachers. And if we're dropping off our youngsters, our kindergartners and our first graders, who's going to be receiving them and taking them to their classrooms? Thank you so much for that question. So again, we are making sure that uh, that there is a set protocol as to how students are going to be engaged at the building. What that looks like depending on the school. Specifically for PS24, I do know that there is a large space outside, right? So we're not saying that you cannot be in the building at all. Um, the first day of school, we all know that the jitters our students may have. Um, so we want to make sure depending on the school what that looks like and the protocols for that are in place. Um, so they can line up outside, you can do a meet the greet, meet and greet the teacher. Um, and some of that will probably happen during the first week of school. We wanna make that, and that's something that usually used to happen the second week, third week of school where we had like an orientation. We're asking that schools have that within the first week of school so that the, especially for the early childhood grades so that the anxiety of, um, you know, who is my, my child's teacher um, and really just building a relationship and that partnership early on. So again, depending on the school and the space, that may look different. Um, we might do orientation and make sure that the orientation of those particular students, maybe we can do one grade a day. Um, so all of that, it all the logistics of the building and the spacing of the building will be determined by the school community. I hope I, I answered that well. <laughs> Superintendent Huller, there is a question that says, can children from two different grades or schools have the same schedule? Uh, it mentions siblings. Can schools have the same schedule? Right, can children or siblings from two different grades or schools have the same schedule? So go to school at the same time, I guess is what they're asking. Yes, normally um, all the schools have a set time that they begin. Um, depending on the size of the school, again, that might change. We have schools that range, you know, and have students, about 200 students. And again, only 33% of those 200 can be in the building. But we also have schools that have 1,600, right? And so in a school with 1,600, and I'm going to use... Um, Two PS, I don't know if anyone here is from PS uh, MS 279. So PS MS 279, we know that right now we have about 400 students that want to come back to the building. And so we might consider a scattered um, dismissal or even a scattered. And when I say scattered, it's not going to be by this tremendous amount of difference in time, but just to be able to control the crowd. I did see... Um, someone asking about siblings. So someone has a child at PS 85 and another at PS 209, which I know is very close to each other. Again, um, right now at the elementary school, it's still zoning. So if you have a child at PS 85, which means that more than likely 85 is your zone school, you can probably transfer your children to one school. That is something that you can call the Family Welcome Center and make sure that that is something that you, that you would like to do. And we could coordinate that now. You do not need to wait until the school year, for the school year to open, if that is the case. Okay, do we have another question? Do we have any questions from the Spanish room? The interpreters? Just to note, Superintendent Hala, 15 minutes. Yes, my corner is uh, already asking in the Spanish line, so can you just give us a second? He is going to gather the, the question. No problem. I'm going to just gather. I see some questions here. Um, 
in regards to a student entering 40, middle school 45. Um, yes, right now, in regards to the days, parents have to be notified by August 28th. Some schools might do it sooner. Um, if there is a specific preference that you would, that, you know, we know that parent coordinators are still available, principals are still available, our office is still available, but in regards to the specific cohort and model that the school, they have until the 28th to be able to provide that to the families. If you would like to figure it out sooner, um, please contact the school. Yeah, they asked about it. So I'll just let them know that there's a question and I can ask it. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, I was not on mute. Um, so yes, there's a question from the Spanish line and the question- um, I, I know that there, I see that there's a question. However, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, um, will there be school bus transportation or do we have to leave our kids at school? So again, busing in the, for the New York City Department of Education is very different. Busing is not provided to every student. So depending on the student and of how the parent applied for the busing. So that's also very different. Mo the majority of our students with disabilities are entitled to busing. So yes, those students will be offered I'm sorry, I was Nicolas, actually, yeah. I was on mute for um, the first part of your response. Could you please repeat the first first part of your answer? So busing is only provided to specific students. Entonces, los... And I believe that there was another part that I missed after that too. And so busing will be, if a student with disability has busing options, then yes, that will still be available to the student. And it will be available to the student only on the days that the student is assigned to go to school, to attend school. And again, busing, considering um, the option, making sure that the parent enrolled the child in blended learning. I'm sorry, Superintendent Halla. There's there in the chat, someone is asking again about high school questions. If you could just repeat what you shared earlier. Okay, thank you, Jackie. So again, I am not the high school. Okay, yes, I am not the high school. I saw someone um, wrote that in. I am not the high school superintendent for District 10. The high school superintendent for District 10 is Sabrina Cook. We also have another Superintendent Richard Cintron. So some of those, some of the infinity schools, the superintendent for the high schools is Richard Cintron. And for the community schools, so Bronx High School of Science, Lehman, and the majority of the schools in District 10 are under Sabrina Cook. Superintendent Hala, we have Valerie Stevens Salmon who would like to ask a question. She has been unmuted. Maria, she's still showing. Uh, it looks like she's still muted. The question was answered already. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. We have uh, Mohammed Indiaye. He has been unmuted. Before Mr. Muhammad comes on, he's not muted yet. Just wanna make sure that parents know. It, whether your child is remote learning or blended learning, yes, there will be an interaction with your child's teacher. I see someone from PS56 has joined us and asked if the teacher will be acquainted with the student. Absolutely. We will make sure that whether it's remotely or in the building that all of the students meet their classroom teacher. How the teaching is going to happen on a daily basis, we are still negotiating some of that with the UFT. However, all students will be able to meet a classroom teacher. So 
So again, in regards to parents who have will have decided on remote teaching, um, one of the questions is, will there be live instruction for all students? So the live instruction as of right now, it was not mandated. Some, some teachers did live instruction, some teachers uploaded videos, some teachers um, emailed parents or did a phone call. So it's very different. Um, one of the things that we are negotiating right now is how much time it will be live instruction, how much time it will be the student working on a blend on a program on, on a, whether it's I learn or I ready. Um, but there's also there will always be a connection to an adult that will be there to support your child. Um, the school day, whether at the building or remote, students will be entitled to five and a half hours of school of schooling. So the school day will be five and a half hours a day, whether you're remote or in the building. Someone in the Spanish line has a question, if I can uh, translate for them, please. La, um, I will say this uh, question in Spanish first, and then I will translate it in English. La pregunta es, yo soy una madre de la escuela 95. Ya llené el formulario pidiendo que fuera uh, mixto, pero ahora quiero que solo sea remoto. ¿Cómo puedo hacer eso? Uh, I'm a parent for school 95 and I already filled out my questionnaire and I replied that I wanted a blended uh, learning, but now I just want only remote. What can I do or how can I do it? Maria, you want to take that? I know we answered, but. Sure. Um, so you have the option to switch to 100% fully remote learning by using the remote learning preference survey. I have posted it in the chat. It is also available on the DOE website. Just to clarify again, as the superintendent has mentioned, any parent who did not fill out the survey by the deadline of last Friday was automatically enrolled into blended learning by default. So if that is not the option that you want, or in this case, if you have changed your mind, you can opt for the 100% remote learning option by filling out the survey on the DOE website. I will repost it again in the chat. Thank you. So I know someone asked again, will the school call us um, in regards to what days their child will be in school? You should will receive, a, you should receive a letter and you should receive an email from the school. Schools will not be making phone calls the first option will be by August 28th to notify all parents. So it is really important for parents if you do not have a school's account to make sure that you have that school account open. And if you need support with that, you can contact the parent coordinator from your school. And if you cannot get a hold of the parent coordinator, please feel free to contact our office and we can provide you with the link on how to make sure to apply for the school's account. Superintendent Holler, there is a question about how many students will be in the classroom. Can you maybe specify that a little bit? So again, um, our schools are range very differently. However, every principal has received guidance on how many students or how many bodies, I shouldn't say students, how many people can be in a classroom. So depending on the size of the classroom, it deter will determine the amount of bodies that can be. So if the classroom, the principal has the, um, the document and it says room 101, only eight, eight people, then it's going to be seven students and one adult. That adult is accounted for within the number of people who, have, who could be in the room. Again, it's, that's general ed, right? If it's an ICT class, then and eight people have to go into that room, then there's going to be six students and two adults. 
So it's very important to know, again, for principals, um, they all have this list as to how many students can be in a class. The highest that I've heard so far is about 10 students with an, one adult or 10 students and two adults. That's the highest that I've heard. But again, that all depends on the school building. Okay, so in regards to instruction and curriculum, it's all based on, on the school. We do know that yes, we, we are still mandated to follow the state standards. We have also provided professional learning to our, all of our schools in regards to the national quality standards on how to teach remotely. So we've been doing a lot of professional development um, for our communities to be able to understand how do we utilize the common core learning standards, but how does that look like remotely? And so again, it all depends on the platform. I do know that someone mentioned the iLearn platform. That is one of the platforms that right now the DOE use during the summer and is thinking and considering of using throughout the school year. So this is a very good safety question. And again, we're waiting on guidelines in the sense of um, if someone is has an exception in regards to the mask, um, obviously that exception will need to be documented and people will be notified um, how the exception and what qualifies for that. Again, we don't make those rules. There was another question from the Spanish room, if we have time to take that now. Yes. Okay, the question is, I'm gonna say it first in English. Um, uh, my son is a special education, needs a special education, and I would like to know if he's going to receive uh, his uh, therapy. Mi pregunta es, mi hijo tiene educación especial y quisiera saber si va a seguir recibiendo su terapia eh, como antes. So any child that has that has um, an IEP that states that he or she needs a service, whether it's speech, physical therapy, occupational therapy, they are entitled to that and we are entitled to ensure that the student receives the service. So if it's stated in their individual educational plan, the service will be provided to them. I noticed a question in regards to state exams and state exams not being um, given to students. And we know that some schools requested the state exam results as part of the application process. The DOE has stated that they cannot, we obviously don't have any results for the state exam. Um, so right now, I know that people are thinking about what would the application process look like and what will schools be asking for. Um, last, update on that was that we would probably be looking at the year before. So if a fifth grader entering, um, entering fifth grader applying for middle school, then we would look at obviously in fourth grade, they did not take the state exam. So we will look at the third grade, we will look at their attendance, we will look at um, various options. And they're thinking about looking also in regards to portfolios, all schools should have had other assessments. Um, many of our schools used iReady as a form of assessing students and assessing their level, whether it's in reading or in math. So some of those, some of that data can also be used, but no child should be penalized because they were not allowed to take the New York State exam. Those exams were not available to anyone. And so the application process is going to be different this year and that cannot be considered. Superintendent, hello, the time is 7.29. Okay, we will take one more question. And I, before I take this question, I just wanna again thank, we've had so many wonderful, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to speak to so many participants. Um, please, again, I, I can't reiterate all this, a lot of the information is on the New York City Department of Education site. If there is something that you're not understanding, your school should be there to support you and provide an explanation 
um, in regards to the documents that are there. Again, as I mentioned, some of the, the information we provided, we provided specifically as a district. However, some of the information is very specific to a school. So we are asking our principals to make sure that they do an orientation, that when they send out their letters, that their letters um, really go into describing what remote learning, what blended learning will look like, okay? Superintendent Halla, Ms. Beatrice Concepcion has posted that she has a question. Uh, we will um, unmute her now and she can ask her question. This will be our last question for the evening. Okay. I just wanna answer this one question in regards to the NEST program. So yes, one of our schools does have the NEST program and that elementary school, PS396 uh, with that NEST program, um, the option to ch was not different. Um, they weren't with one of the chancellor's models. Um, so the option in regards to NEST students, it would still be the same option. NEST students are part of our community school district schools, elementary schools. And so they will be provided that opportunity as well. Thank you, Superintendent Hala. Ms. Concepcion, you have been unmuted. Um, yes, I, my question is one of the moms said something about younger kids. When we take them to school, should we wait out front before leaving just in case their temperature is 100 degrees? Because I know you guys are going to send them home, correct? Yes. So if a child has a temperature and the parent is not available, they will be placed in the isolation room until the parent is available to pick them up. So once again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Community School District 10. Any questions you may have, please, once again, I'm gonna reiterate our Community Education Council also has their upcoming meeting and that will be sent to all of our schools. The information is provided to all parent coordinators on a monthly basis and to all of our principals. Have a good evening.